patience as we get started. Um, hopefully you're all in the right room. This is containers, and no, we won't be talking about your mama's Tupperware. My name is El Marquez, and I'm a technical trainer for the Rackspace Private Cloud. I also do a lot of community evangelism, a lot of just going out and recruiting new people to the industry. So normally, this is where a speaker gives you their street cred, right? Like, they give you their alphabetical pedigree. You know, I have an uh, RHCSA, an RHCE, an OCA. None of that matters. Today, I stand before you a newbie. I am brand new to containers. And the way that they say is the best way to learn something is to get up and teach it, right? Put your money where your mouth is. So that's what I'm here to do today. There are times that throughout this, you may have a question that I don't know the answer to. So this is where I ask you, how many of you have experience with like LXD? Docker? You got something back, Docker? Kubernetes. All right, you see these guys that raise their hands, especially my friend there in the back? These are gonna be our subject matter experts. So you know what, if you have a question, don't feel like, oh, I might not ask that, I'm gonna embarrass her. Like, I'm okay being embarrassed. We have people here, we're here to learn. Everybody good at that? So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna start a journey and this whole talk got started when I was asked to write a course on getting certified in Kubernetes. Not a big ask, except for the fact that I had no idea what Kubernetes was. So I went to our subject matter experts and I said, what is Kubernetes? And they said, container orchestration. And I kind of stood there, hear the crickets, I'm like, I have no idea what that means, can I get more? Well, you know, it helps orchestrate your Linux containers. Cricket, like, you literally define what I'm asking you with the words that I asked you to define. So that's what I point out to my journey. All right, so what is Kubernetes? Well, it has to do with Docker on some ports, but honestly, you can use any form of containerization technology behind it. So we'll be addressing both Docker and LXD, as well as other forms of machine containers. But our journey really needs to begin with virtualization, because it's what most people are accustomed to. So the journey today begins with a simple computer. When you go out and you buy a computer, we took our tech snob hats and put them away. For most people, it really doesn't matter what the OS is. They buy it because they have applications that they want to use. So it could be Windows, it could be Linux, it could be Mac OS, it doesn't matter. But then you have a few of us who may be software developers, they may be deploying and testing code, they may be like me, and I work off of a Mac for work, but I work in OpenStack. So I have a Linux box. And then came the time that everybody in my house was <coughs> playing, wow, I didn't want to be left out. I wanted to play too. So I got a Windows box. Then I started learning in my career and I needed a development center and I needed a laptop to be able to travel with. And then suddenly I wanted to do a multi-node deployment. So my office ended up looking like this. I can't be the only one in this room who has a room in their house that looks like this, right? <laughs> so what happens when you start needing to travel? when you want to be able to develop when you, when you go. I have seen a few of you walking around with two and three laptops in your backpack, like more power to you, but no. I turned to virtualization. So what is virtualization? Well, at its key, I would say that virtualization by itself is actually not a technology. It's more of a concept. It's separating the underlying hardware from the operating system. It's done through the use of hypervisor technology. So we take the computer that we have, and yes, this is back to the basics to some of you, but it's important to understand these concepts before understanding the separation that occurs in containers. Take a Type 2 hypervisor, and you install that on top of the operating system. So here I have Mac, and on top of that I have VirtualBox running. And in my VirtualBox environment, I have two different virtual machines, each running its own operating system. So I actually do have one running Windows, and I have another one running Linux. Each one supports its own binary <coughs> libraries, and each one has their own applications. What does this enable me to do? This enables me to use one of my boxes as my OpenStack deployment, because OpenStack releases every six months. So every six months, I have to learn something from the bottom up, and I'm gonna hose this environment. We're talking, I'm gonna be celebrating when I go more than 24 hours without a kernel panic. So I can't do that and then come up here and present and go, all right guys, I don't know what's going on with my computer. I need that separation occurring. So what happens though if I'm, let's say, working for a larger company where I have need to have even more separation? Well, I can do something like a server. On servers, we generally install type one hypervisors. Now type one hypervisors, because they don't have that level of operating system in between, are generally agreed upon to have higher performance, availability, and security. 
So let's get to the separation. When we, when we create these virtual machines, really you're just creating another set of machines. So basically you can kind of treat a virtual machine like its own computer. The issue is that it requires that resources be allocated to it from the host machine. So let's just say that I went down to Goodwill and I got this server and it has 16 gigs of RAM. All right. So I allocate a VM with eight. Cool. And I allocate another one with four. Everything's going according to plan. But what happens when I now need to duplicate that original VM? Now this is where some people pop their collars and they tell me, oh, well, it's simple. All you do is you configure your hypervisor to allow over allocation of resources. No, you don't. You turn off one of the computers, you wait for it to release its uh, resources back, and then you create your new one. You can imagine that if you're running multiple environments, if you're testing and spinning up code and making changes, this gets to be a long and tedious process. We go back to the spinning in chairs like when we're waiting for our code to compile. No, nobody wants that. So that waste of time, that just kind of stressful situation, is what led to the development of infrastructure as a service company, or as we know it now, the cloud. And the cloud was great, right? This enabled us to have resources whenever we wanted them, and we could just spin them up and delete them without having to manage all of that infrastructure. But we still had an issue, and that was underutilization of resources. You had to buy these cloud servers in a predefined size. We wanted more for our money. And that, in my opinion, not an expert here, but in my opinion, is what led to the development of containerization. If you go out and you look about containers, and especially if you're looking into Docker, they represent containers as like these big metal containers that are meant to go across the ocean and survive. That's not what a container is. When you think about containers, I want you to think about Tupperware. But no, not your mom's Tupperware. I'm talking about that cheap piece of plastic Tupperware that you get at HEB when you buy the lunch meat, and then you throw your lunch in it and you forget it in your trunk for a week, so you just kind of throw it away and pretend it never existed. That's what a container is. But due to the lack of what, a kind of a predefined definition of what a container is, most people think of containers as like this brand new technology. It's new and it's exciting, but it's not. Containers actually began their development with the Chiru command in 1982, or I'm sorry, 1978. And it was adopted later by BSD in 1982. Containers have been on this earth longer than I have. So, sorry, cue the joke. Um, in two, thank you. So then uh, we had the development of the gel command. Most Linux users know this. Then we had the exciting stuff happen. We had Google get involved. And Google has some deep pockets. They began their work with process containers in 2006. Now, do not get me wrong. Google was not the only company that was actually developing and helping to spur containerization technology. But they were by far the loudest. They were the ones willing to go to conferences, to talk, to open it up to open source. So if you are a little bit of a nerd like me and you're willing to read white papers, I encourage you to go out and seek the Borg papers. Borg as in Star Trek and just delve into them. It is a great story. I, that's, I read it as a story, it is a white paper, but what the cause and what the need was within Google that caused them to put so much money into the work of process containers. Those of you that know about Kubernetes, Kubernetes is actually the open source software version of their board project. So sometime around 2008, I believe, Google and all the other companies go to the Linux kernel summit and they sit down and they start hashing this out. You know, what do we really need? What is the use case? What are you doing for this? And the result ended up being Linux namespaces. They were adopted into the Linux kernel. And so basically you have your Linux kernel and your namespaces live within it. Um, the namespaces work very similar to a type two hypervisor. Because what they do is they restrict the resources that a process to has to on the host. So I'm gonna kind of go open source community here. Who can tell me what a process is? And explain it to me like I'm five. It gets scary, right? When you're new, even the simplest thing that you've been using forever, when you get called upon it, just kind of starts giving you that, like, I know, but I don't know how to say it. I put this slide in because I want to challenge you guys that when someone comes to you and they're new to this technology and they ask you a question, remember that moment. Because think about how much vulnerability it took for them to come up and admit that they didn't know. All right, that's just my little preaching there. So what's a process? 
All right, so a process is a set of instructions for your computer to perform. So it's basically taking a list, saying, computer, I want you to do one, two, three, and four, go and prosper. But Linux is a multi-processing <coughs> operating system, which means it's going to be doing this uh, more, one, more than one process at a time, which means that a lot of these processes belong to the same application. Now, it would not really suit as well if our application couldn't talk to itself. It couldn't report back to itself. So we use Linux namespaces in order to provide a separation um, for these processes from the global environment. It becomes how we secure our multi-user, multi-application environment. And so when I say namespace, or when I say containers, this is what I'm talking about. All right. We all good to this point? All right, cool. I like it. People are actually nodding. <laughs> all right, so we begin first with our inter-process communication namespace. Now, this mes what this namespace does is it offers a message queue for each process to be able to communicate and receive messages outside of its own container. So we have process A running in one container, process B running in a container. They belong to the same application. So because they have a shared namespace, they're able to communicate with one another. As containers need to be ephemeral. This means I need to be able to get a container, kill it off, put a brand new one in its place, and I need my application to act like absolutely nothing happened. We needed the UTS namespace. This is called the Unix time sharing namespace. Now what it does is it allows for isolation of host names for each container. Now some of you may be thinking, all right, cool, the process has a host name, like whoop de doo what does that mean? Well, it means that you're not having to reprogram your code every single time. You can now use commands like hostname or uname as unique identifiers for that container. Um, so next we needed our mount namespace. Our mount namespace uh, does pretty much what the name implies. It controls what file system mount points were visible to each container. Now most of you who use Linux know that normally when you mount or unmount a file system, it's gonna be presented and affect your entire global environment. What the mount namespace did is it provided a way for you to say, you know what, only container A has access to this USB disk or only to this you know, NAS server or whatever you're using. And okay, so after that, we needed a way for, our, for us to isolate our processes. The PID namespace allowed for each container to have its own process ID numbers. What this did was it helped the init systems need to have PID1 within each container. The PID namespace allowed us to have the functionality of being able to develop on this computer, shut down the process within the container, move it to another computer, spin it back up and ensure that we didn't have PID number conflict. Now that we have the ability to have PID1, we needed the ability to have a root user within that computer without having to give root access to our entire computer. So this became the, um, oh, I lost my kind of thought. Uh, this became our, our new security feature, which allowed us each container to have its own UID and GUIDs, user IDs and group user IDs. So let's say that we were to have a security breach and we were to have an application or a person be able to break out of the container. This would ensure that they would then become just a nobody user within our host. Now I know in this room a lot of you are sitting there thinking, well, I could do this and I could do that. Yes, attacks are getting smarter, but with this we've had, the, I mean, we're talking, this is the bottom of uh, our building here. You know, we go from namespaces to our Docker files, to our Kubernetes containers, to our Gvisors, to our Kata containers. So I don't want you to, under to believe that just because you use a namespace, you're suddenly secure, all right? Just putting that out there. All right, so next we needed a way to, um, our last namespace is we needed a way to have networking. So we have our network namespace. Our network namespace creates another copy of our network stack. This means every single namespace is gonna have, network namespace, will have its own routing tables, its own firewall rules, and its own network devices. It's important though to note that currently, and mind you, this could change probably within the next two to three weeks because development is occurring here, you can only have one network device per network namespace. So you're gonna have to start using things like virtual, uh, virtual tunnels to be able to connect between network namespaces. Just wanted to get that out there. You can also use bridging, as most of you know, um, but I know that like everything I've just said might have just gone over some of your heads, might have been like, all right, I get it, but I don't even know why it's important. So normally this is when I would drop into a demo, but y'all know that the Wi-Fi has been kind of questionable here. 
So this is why I'm going to say, let's pretend together. We are now logged into my Ubuntu 16.04 cloud server. And the first thing I'm going to list out are IP table rules. You guys, nothing much going on here. It's just a simple cloud server. But I do have fail to ban install. Some of you may have used it. Fail to ban scans or logs and bans IPs that show malicious signs such as too many um, password failures. All right, so then once I get here, I'm able to go in and I use the IP NetNS, network namespace, add, just telling it to add, and the name of my new network namespace is gonna be sample. When you go out and you try this by yourself, you can use any naming convention that you want. I'm just not very creative. All right, so then we do MP NetNS and it lists it out. What this actually did though, is it actually created a mount point inside of var run netNS, and of which network namespace, I've already told you, so that there is actually a way for my network namespace to exist even though I'm not running any processes into it. So that's how that exists without any processes in it. All right, that's pretty cool, but what the interesting thing is I can actually drop into that network namespace. So once I do that, I have executed in my network namespace, being the name sample, a bash shell. I want you to notice that what happened is as soon as I went in, I guess I'm kind of off the example here, but what had occurred is I became the root user. Now if you recall, every network namespace has its own IP table rules. So if you look here and you compare them to the one from our machine, you can see that this network namespace did not inherit the fail to ban application. So this means that if you had, if you had um, networking already set up to allow certain ports to go into your host, this doesn't mean that they would be able to reach your namespace. It has its own, um, its own set of rules. All right, so if I do an IPA, you can see that I actually do have um, networking <coughs> available in this box. I can bring it up. The reason I do this is, all right, so in this box, you can't really see it too well, but I'm logged in um, as a root user. So I jump over. And now I'm actually just on my sample box. I'm not in the network namespace. And I can actually start pinging that network namespace. So I kind of have my own little machine inside of my machine without running a virtual machine, without running an actual Docker container. This is the beginning of kind of where the story starts. All right, cool. So then I go back and I have my network IP addresses. Um, one thing that I do want to mention that I started to earlier, sorry, I'm looping back is let's say that I come in and I set up this container to allow for a web server. So I allow 80 and 443. Get my website going, get everything going, I'm good, right? No, because my host machine still can't accept that traffic. So my container is complete, or my namespace, I'm sorry, is completely isolated despite what rules I've set here. All right, so when I exit my container, I can list out my IP table rules, but this actually, I wish I could tell you I did it on purpose, but <coughs> I forgot that the moment I left my container, I lost that root access. So this is an example of what would happen if you were in a container and able to break out. You wouldn't inherit those um, abilities. We use this a lot in applications such as OpenStack, or in applications, I like guess, software such as OpenStack. What we can do is we can have a whole rack of servers which are running the OpenStack software. We spin up VMs within it, and we can allow whatever range of IP, of IP table rules, networking, communication to occur within those VMs <laughs> not configure the host, and we basically have a standalone environment that we never have to allow access to from the outside world. All right, so the next thing I wanna show you guys, uh, that was my IP table rules, is you have homework. Everybody always asks me after I get done with this talk is how do I get started working with containers? Like my company is using it, they want me to learn, I don't even know where to start. Spin up a Linux server, go into LS, go into LS, yes, go into PROC, do an LS, and I want you to be able to explain to me what these directories are. Most of you are like, all right, well, it's the PS, those are my processes. Okay, cool, but how many of you have actually gone into the namespace directory? Let me uh, put it out, you can't see it too well here, but I have my UTS, my user, my PID, my net. Get to the point where you can explain this to, I'm not even gonna a five-year-old, so you can explain this to a 10-year-old. If you get to the point where you can tell them what is occurring inside of this directory, um, and why I went into stealth. Stealth um, is a directory that allows you to get information of the process that you are currently using or who you currently are. But anyways, when you get to this point and you can explain this to your boss, 
you are above, I would say, 90% of the people who are currently involved in the container community. That's how you get started. All right, so now that I've laid the groundwork for you, we can jump into what we know as containers. So let's talk about machine containers. Machine containers are referred to as operating system containers because they're a method of actually, instead of virtualizing the hardware, we're now separating it and virtualizing the OS. They differ from machine containers in this way, or I'm sorry, mach virtual machines. So like I said in my previous example, I have my Mac, I get VirtualBox, I can have a Linux container, I have a Linux VM, and I can have a Windows VM. No problem. You cannot at this time do that with machine containers. Microsoft is doing some amazing things currently with Azure containers, but they're not quite there yet. So currently if you use machine containers, you'll be limited to the Linux OS. But it does mean that I could have, let's say my Ubuntu 16.04 cloud server be running Ubuntu 14, what, LTS, I believe, um, be running an Alpine container and be running a CentOS container, no problem. Let's see that at work. All right, so I'm gonna be using a, a system, a uh, what is it, a program called LXD. LXD is an extension of uh, Linux containers. And what you can use is you can do LXC list. Cool, I have no containers. The command that you're gonna use is LXC launch. Then I am using Ubuntu 16.04. I've said this like 15 times, so at this point you guys probably know that is the exact same image as the server that I am on. Once again, I'm not very creative. The name is Ubuntu container. I do LXC list. And you can see my machine container is up and running. It's as simple as that to get started using containers. All right, I can do Etsy or cat Etsy issues and you see that I am in fact using the same, uh, um, that that is in fact my operating system. So like I did with a network namespace, I am going to, um, I'm sorry, jumping ahead of my time. So like I said before, you don't have to use the same OS. You notice the command changed here. It's LXC launch Images, the reason I had to put the word images now is I am no longer using the image that my server is, um, is built from. So I have Alpine 3.5, uh, name Alpine container, do an LXC list, cool. Ubuntu 16.04 cloud server running two different machine containers. I can now actually execute an ash shell. The reason I do not use bash is Alpine Linux is a tiny, tiny version of Linux that is so small that it does not incorporate bash into it naturally. So when I do an ash shell, I can say who am I? And apparently I'm the oot user, but that is the root user. I can once again cat at the issues and prove to you that I in fact am now using Alpine Linux 3.5. Some of you may be saying, you know what? I really don't need this at my system. Like I am working with microservices. I'm working with these simple little scripts that all I need is just a small isolated environment so I can run the script, see what actually occurs without having to spin up an entire virtual machine. It's all right. Application containers are probably what you're interested in. Application containers are also referred to as process containers because we like having a lot of names for things in the tech world. Um, this is a way to provision a standalone environment for a single process, and you guys may have actually only heard of one of them, and that is Docker. That is because Docker is the world's leading software platform, and it was developed to build a single application Linux containers. And so with Docker, it differs a little bit from machine containers, because let's say I want to run a web server application. So I might have three containers, one which has Apache, one which has MySQL and the other which is running my Java. Right. As before, you notice that within our machine containers, all three of these applications would be running within the same container. And you can see that here. All right, any questions to this point? You good? All right, I like you guys, you're all really quiet. You can ask questions, I promise. All right, so some of you may be asking though, all right, how do we get to the point where I'm running Apache or I'm running Java without having an operating system? Like, how does that work? Well, it occurs through the use of the Docker image. Now, what a Docker image is, is a series of read-only layers stacked on top of each other. And it begins with a base image. So base image could be CentOS, it could be Ubuntu, it could be something custom made by your company. Currently, primarily Linux images, but like I said, Azure is doing some amazing things right now. And what Docker does is it puts a read-write layer, I'm sorry, on top of your read-only layer. And so 
It makes use of a copy on write strategy, or as we love acronyms in this tech world, we call it CAL. What CAL says is that all of the processes and applications are going to be sharing the same binaries and libraries and, and files until one of them needs to make a change. Once that application A needs to make a change, it will make its own copy on this read-write layer, and it will make changes here, but all of the other applications and processes that are using that library will continue using that base image layer. So changes and copies are only made when an application actually needs to. So let's take, for example, Alpine Linux, because I love using it, and we put our read-write layer on top of it, and I want to update it. Any changes that occurred would be written on this layer. This point, though, I must add, uh, some of you, hopefully, are asking, like, where do I even get a base image? How do I get started in this process? We do so by going to the Docker store. This is where you can get a plethora of images. I might not have to say it in this room, but I think I would be negligent not to. Just because an image is available on the Docker store does not mean it is a trusted source. <laughs> I'm not responsible for what you do. So if you want to play around, go to a company that you trust, whether that be Red Hat, whether that be CentOS, whether it be Alpine, pull your image, then you're going to create an Alpine, a Docker file. But the Docker file is, all right, Docker, what do I want you to do? So in this Docker file, this is really simple. If you decide to go play with it, you can run this exact same thing and get it running off the ground. All I'm saying is, hey, from the Docker hub, because I haven't defined anything else, pull the latest version of Alpine. Now, there, if you go into the Docker hub, you can see that they offer a history of different versions. You can just replace latest with whatever you want. I want you to then go and update it, and then I want you to add HTOP. Now, just looking at this Docker file, can anyone tell me how many read-write layers are going to be there? So read-write layer, oh, yeah, there you go, two. Read-write layers are generated by the issuing of a run command. So every single time you see run, that's going to be another layer that I'm building onto it. But you can see that here. All right, the command that you're going to use once you get that Docker file written is going to be sudo docker build, and that dot is just present working directory. Take the Docker file out of this present working directory, yeah, working directory, and from it we're going to, um, so we say, hey, Docker, do that. Docker goes back and reads our file, and it starts working. So from the Alpine library, it pulls the uh, latest image, pull complete, so that's one action that it took, and it gives me my new base image. That is the ID for my new base image. Step two, so now I'm in another layer, is it runs that update. And I want you to notice though it says running in. It created another container based off that base image that we just pulled to do this work in. Once that's completed, it removes that container, and my next run command builds another container for this to occur. You can kind of see the latency starting to build here, especially if you're running a lot of commands. All right, once that has been removed, it is built successfully. Um, one thing, though, that I do want to note is the image that I have highlighted here is only available in your cache because you actually never told Docker that you needed this image. It's just one of the processes, or one of the steps that has to be taken to get you to what you wanted. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and the reason I bring it up that is in your cache is if let's say you decide to create another image taking the exact same step with the exact same base image, it um, actually occurs quicker because it already has it stored in its local cache. Have I said that enough times there? <coughs> All right, once it's completed, we've successfully built and we now have two images the base image that we pulled, and the one that we wanted it to create. If you're like me and you're a visual learner, this is what we did. Alpine, update, HTOP, yay, new image. But as I, had, I stood up here and kind of counted those out for you, hopefully some of you are getting into scripting or already script. You could do something simple like this and just to cut down on your run commands. Despite the fact that I have now run three quote unquote Linux commands, I only used one run command so that image will only have the base layer, which is already on my system, and the one container that it's going to need to build. All right, cool. So why does this matter? Well, you can use it more than just building images. You can use Docker to run just single little bits of applications. So one of the ways that I like to show this is through a program or uh, an image called WellSay. Now, how many of you have used Linux CalSay? Nobody's played with that? Yay, well, right, go look up Linux CalSay. It's fun, it's something to entertain your kids with and make them think that you, you know, do amazing things as, I don't know, Linux admin or whatever you do. 
All right, so um, you can use the command sudo docker run. And what you're telling in here is docker, go to the docker hub, from the docker hub, and the docker repository, my bad, it's going from the docker repository, pull the image well say. And well say, I'm gonna say hey, say cow say hello world. Now I paused it here because I wanna show you if I was doing this live, we would have to sit here and wait for every single one of those layers to pull. Now imagine if you're automating this across hundreds of servers or thousands of containers. It's definitely gonna add to your latency. So I'd encourage you if you don't script to at least play around, become a little bit of a bash monkey there and play around with it and try to get your container, um, I'm sorry, your images as small as you can. But what's since completed, we have our well saying hello world. So at this point, I've been talking for a good half hour. We've covered virtualization. We've covered machine containers. We've covered application containers. We've gone into Docker and how Docker image is built. That's a lot of stuff. So at this point, you may be wondering, like, if I have all of this available to me, why do I even need Kubernetes? Like, why is Kubernetes the new hot right now? Like I said, imagine, I mean, it took me, what, half an hour to get here to build you guys through this. Imagine if you have an infrastructure that goes across multiple cities, states, countries, with hundreds of servers, thousands of virtual machines. I mean, CERN just spun up their two millionth virtual machine, and that was like three years ago. I don't even know where they are now. Can you imagine trying to automate this using Ansible through, I mean, no, nothing against Ansible, but that's just gonna be a lot of work there. So that's what kind of Kubernetes does. Kubernetes becomes our container orchestration. Hey, it took me half an hour to get you there, but now you understand what container orchestration is. So let's say that I have an application. Let's say that I'm using, and I'm not gonna pick on a company, um, cloud service A. I have three cloud servers. Predominantly, when I was building my application, it would be written to the environment in which I was working in. Enter vendor lock-in. It became very difficult for me to switch from cloud computing A to cloud computing B. Um, because I would have to rewrite my code. I'd have to get everybody back in there. Kubernetes offers a way to be able to kind of break apart from, container, um, from that vendor lock-in. Because I now write my application to work with my Docker images, my LXD images, whatever um, technology you're using. And so when I'm ready to, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm not leaving Cloud Server, right? maybe I'm just increasing my presence, I can now move my application from one cloud computing company or one OpenStack build to another. And it all starts with setting a desired state. Now, so for those of you that came in because your company is interested in Kubernetes and that's what you're interested in, this is the part where you start listening. Because what you wanna walk away with is understanding the differences between your desired state and your observed state. Kubernetes, the entire job, all it actually really does is it sits there and it watches your system. And it says, does this system live up to the rules and the regulations that I have been given that it should live up to? I'll get into what that actually means though. So the Kubernetes is, um, maintains a control plane record of Kubernetes objects on the system and it runs in a continuous loop to manage those object states. It begins with the base uh, unit of deployment in Kubernetes. So this is where we get our vocabulary in. Base unit of, um, in Kubernetes is the pod. You can think of a pod as kind of just like a small server living inside of what is known as a node. We'll get to that in just a second. So even if, let's say, you wanna run a tiny little script inside of one little container, if you're using Kubernetes, it's going to make it inside of a pod. It does so because it can use this pod as a base unit of replication. So every time you say, you know what, I want 15 versions of this script running, it can just go and create that exact same pod over and over again. Now, if you're deploying multiple containers inside of a pod, so I have, let's say, three processes running like I do here, they need a way to be able to communicate with each other. Enter your network namespace. All Kubernetes does is it's making use of those Linux namespaces that we covered at the beginning in order to help communication occur between these containers inside of the pod. Now I did say that a pod exists inside of a node. Inside of Kubernetes, two more terms you need to know, and that is master node and worker node. What a worker node is, is it could be a virtual server, it could be a physical server, it can be whatever it is that you wanna use, but it works kind of like a, it could be like I said, a VM. It, what it does is it allows a place for you to be able to have all of your containers existing inside of those pods. And it has um, different applications inside of it, different APIs. 
that allow it to communicate with the server going like, yep, I've got you know, 14 pods running. Hey, this one pod broke. It allows that communication to occur to the master server, or the master node, which is what I told you guys about. As end users um, of Kubernetes, you will only ever communicate with a master node. The master node is what takes your instructions and it checks its environment of worker nodes. So one thing I should have mentioned, I'm sorry, is you can have and you will have, you should have multiple worker nodes. I mean, you should have maybe one master and hundreds of workers. And what the master does is it combines all of its resources into what we know as a cluster. So you don't actually ever need to care where your application is running as long as it's running, right? So it's a collection of processes running behind a single node. Um, those of you in larger corporations, your company may have multiple servers configured as masters. Only one is actually acting as a master. The others are called leaders. They're just sitting there waiting for the master to die off, and as soon as it does or something happens, they hold a little election, one comes up, and it says, all right, I'm the master now. It's there for redundancy. Cool. So I've given you guys all the terminology. If you have any questions on that, Please ask, I know I went through it kind of quick, but I know everybody just kind of gets bored with the vocab lesson. So let's pull it all together. There. I have my master node, I have my worker node. Now, I told you guys that it's really just kind of silly to have one worker node, you're not really using Kubernetes. So we're gonna expand our environment into three nodes. But I will, let, that's us right there. And we want to have more than one version of our application running. So we issue an API command, or we can use a lot of the services such as kubectl or a GUI, if that's what you have access to, to tell our worker node, hey, you know what? Our site's getting kind of popular. I want two versions of my web app running right now. So Kubernetes goes ahead and sets up that work. But let's say that, you know what? My first picture, I'm building this in my office, and my roommate has decided to go in and sweep, and he unplugs one of my machines. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so Good that's no problem. <laughs> That's when Kubernetes says, you know what, no, my job was to ensure that there were two versions of that app running, and it moves it to another system. All right, so let's go ahead and go back into um, our server. As you can tell, maybe it's a little small, I'm actually logged into a different server. This is the master node of my Kubernetes cluster, and what I'm gonna be showing you guys today is a way to interact with it using the kubectl command. Kubectl just makes the API calls to the master to get the information that I need back uh, really simply. So the command is as simple as kubectl get nodes. Those are the nodes. I don't actually have to go out and do the authentication and put an authentication string and send out an API call every single time I want information. I would be negligent to tell you guys or actually not to tell you guys, that there is a GUI available for Kubernetes. I just thought it would be a little silly for me to sit here and do command line for everything else and be like, all right guys, watch me push these buttons. So we're gonna teach you a little bit of command line here. All right, like I said, kubectl is super simple. Hey, I wanna know what pods I have in my environment. Guess what, kubectl get pods. This is also written by, I believe, Linux admins, and if anybody knows a Linux admin, we are the laziest of the lazy, and if we can script it, we will. So you can actually use kubectl get po, because pods was too long. All right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so all right. Now we talk about namespaces. So if I do kubectl get ns, one thing I wanna point out, these aren't your Linux namespaces. Kubernetes also uses the term namespaces to um, differ, the way that it differentiates is namespaces within Kubernetes are a way for you to give, uh, have multiple environments within your company. So let's say that, you know what, I do have limited resources. I only have X amount of computers and we all kind of share them. Through the use of Kubernetes, I could have one environment for my development team, one environment from my prod team, and one environment for my team who perhaps sections off things that have been compromised and does investigations. And each one of those environments can actually share, uh, can actually have the same names. So inside of, let's say I have my practice namespace. If I, contain, if I created L's container one, I couldn't create another L containers one. However, that name could exist within uh, any other one of my namespaces. Is that as clear as mud or did that make sense? So if something happens, I can be moving my server around without, the, um, without being afraid of you know, the name clash. All right, let's see if there was anything else that I wanted to point out. Oh, one important thing that I learned the hard way. When you go out and practice this, if you kill off your namespace, everything that lives in that namespace will be gone and you will not be able to get it back. That was a lesson hard learned. 
All right, so if I do kubectl get pods, and you notice that when I did it first, it said that I didn't have any resources. But now when I tag on that all namespaces, suddenly I do have a pod up and running. That's because whenever you use, uh, whenever we just go in and it's just your basic build, it's automatically gonna put you into the default namespace. If you create any resources and you don't tell it what name to put it in, it's automatically gonna put it into that default namespace. All right, so let's say that I wanna use Kubernetes and I like the web app example, I don't know what to tell you guys. And I decide that I wanna run a web app. This isn't an image or anything. Like I said, I'm not creative. That's just my naming convention. But I'm going to be using the image Nginx, and because I'm pretending it's a web app here, I'm going to be exposing port 80 on the container. Now, if I were to run this, could you from the outside world connect to this box, or connect to this web server? No, because my actual machine hasn't been, that I would need to set the application rules to my machine, where my container is exposed, but if I haven't allowed traffic in from the outside world, it can't get to it. And in examples of things like OpenStack, that's fine, because I'm having all my communication happen internally. All right. So um, let's say that I do my kubectl git pods, and cool, there's my pod up and running. Let's say that, you know what, I close my lid here, I go on, and I come back another day, and I'm looking at this, and I'm like, why was I running a web app? Like, I don't even remember what I was doing. To delete the pod should be simple enough, right? kubectl, delete pod, and I do the name. We do a get pods to confirm, except that my app is still there. Maybe tell me what happened? Kubernetes restarted because it thought it was a fail. So not a restart, it created a whole new one, because if you look at the name, it's there. I know, but it's important, it didn't restart it, it actually did do what it said. It went in and it deleted that container. But then it created a new, a new one, because I told it that that's what I wanted it to do. All right, so that goes back to our desired state and observed state. Now, there's actually a lot more to it. Um, what I actually did was I didn't create a pod. I kind of went behind, I created a deployment, which is what tells Kubernetes to get that going. Um, but Kubernetes within itself is a monster um, on its own. I guess I got a little nervous today and I talked a little faster than I usually do because normally I am like at time. Um, but I do want to offer the ability to you guys, if you want to know more about not containerization, Kubernetes by itself, how you get an app and you get it running, um, we have a class going on next Wednesday. Normally we sell it, but it's not your guys' fault that I couldn't get everything into one. So if you want to attend it, it's um, how to get a Hello World app up and running in um, Kubernetes. Feel free to go to training at rackspace.com, use that promo code, and you can take the course for free. Get out of the way. Yeah, it's free, sorry, that's 100% free. <laughs> you can haze her, it's okay. All right. Cool, do we have any questions? Oh, sorry, sorry, I thought people were done taking pictures. <laughs> no. So it's an hour long webinar, you can attend it from your desk. I don't know, I'd have to ask my, I mean, if, I guess that depends on your boss. I'd have to ask my boss, I guess, I have no idea. I've never had somebody else. Okay. All right. Any? Oh yes. Right there. Yes. Public service announcement. Yes. one question that I generally get um, that I think is actually really important is most people always ask me, you know, well, like, why would I use a container instead of a virtual machine? Or why would I use an application container instead of a machine container? And I don't think it's a valid question because the answer is use all of them. So one thing that I do when I'm going out there and I'm pulling images that I don't know, first of all, I'm using my, my what I call my burner computer, the one that always gets re-imaged anyways because I'm going to break it. And then I have a virtual machine running in it. And I end up having an application, or, I'm sorry, a machine container inside of that or something like Kata containers, and I'm running it inside of that. So I'm like sandboxing my sandbox for my sandbox. I, so there are, it's really important to know that this technology is not use one or another. Like, 
all of this is nested virtualization. So don't ever feel like you have to pick one, you know, you have to use Docker. I've used Docker on top of my LXD container before. Like, it's, I don't know, just go and have fun. That's my big message, is go and play with this and break it and delete it and start over again. Good, any more questions? Yes? When did you say it starts? It is, I believe, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, we do two. This code will actually work for the second one, but you've already sat through it. We have another one, Understanding Containerization. So if you know somebody maybe from your company that might have wished they could have been here today, you can give them this code. Um, that one is this Wednesday coming up, and they can use the code. Check the website to make sure I haven't flipped them, but the code is both, uh, good for both of them. It works. It works? <laughs> there you go. We good? Yes? This, uh, or is it it's a webinar, so yeah, you'll just go in and we'll, you'll register through Zoom, and we'll send you a Zoom link that will become live at like 9.45 that Tuesday morning. If you have any issues with like, burning me, you'll have to